So welcome everybody to the second day of the PhilAB Ontario Hub Regional Conference. Um, we're going to be doing a session now on grant making foundations and their response to the current crisis. And for this uh, session, um, I, Kristen Pugh, I'll be moderating. And then um, I'm also joined by Isadora Sidorovska, Paloma Rego, and Megan Conway, who will be each giving presentations of about 20 minutes, and then we'll have about half an hour set aside for Q&A at the end. All right, let's get into it. So our first presenter is Isadora Sidorovska, um, and she is presenting on foundation responses to COVID-19. So go ahead. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is great. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Kristen. Uh, I will um, actually, as fate would have it, of course, um, my internet crashed. So I'm gonna ask now Catherine if she can share my presentation. And since I'm also uh, signing from my phone, I'm, unfortunately, I will turn off my video as well while I'm presenting and uh, then I'm gonna turn it on and hopefully it's gonna uh, work okay. So, um, yeah, Catherine, we can just if we can just put it on yeah full screen. Uh, so the the study uh, I will be presenting today uh, is basically an initial attempt to learn a bit more about how uh, COVID nineteen has affected the charitable sector in Canada. And we can just move to to the next slide, Catherine. Um, it's bas it basically consists of a series of case studies which are looking at the effects of the global pandemic over uh, Canada's philanthropic community. And it was a, basically a first step in exploring the adaptive capacity of Canadian foundations to uh, respond to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, so uh, the goal was to capture some of the novel initiatives either developed or supported by Canadian foundations in response to the outbreak and just see what kind of impact some of these initiatives might have in the future. Uh, the data from this analysis was actually meant to complement um, a systematic survey uh, done by uh, Philanthropic Foundations Canada, as well as a Delphi method-based uh, uh, examination of perspectives uh, of experts in the field. And we'll actually hear a bit more about this uh, uh, by Dr. Rago uh, today. So um, we can move to the next slide. Um, just before uh, I get into the, um, uh, the findings, uh, a brief overview of the methods. Uh, what we did is we conducted four exploratory case studies. Uh, these included eight in-depth interviews and also an analysis of relevant uh, documents and other sources of data which were supplied by our interviewees. And these um, also note that these interviews were conducted, conducted during May 2020. So basically they reflect the early, the initial responses of the pandemic, even though we we did some follow-up um, interviews a year later and these reports should also be available soon. So what were the research questions we were looking at? Um, for one, uh, how have grant-making foundations responded to COVID-19 in the early days of the pandemic? Uh, then uh, how do these changes relate to the dominant philanthropic model and practices? And eventually we also try to look at some long-term implications or, or learnings that we could um, extract from these processes. Can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, so I, um, yeah, so just briefly, uh, sort of uh, I, what were the, the uh, case studies around? Uh, we did one on the Lawson Foundations, uh, Foundation and its responses to COVID-19. So in this case, we were looking at the uh, organization and the variety of uh, tools and programs mm -hmm. that um, it had developed uh, in response to the pandemic. Uh, we also looked at the Indigenous Peoples Resilience Fund, IPRF. Um, so this was an initiative set up by Indigenous knowledge holders in partnership with several uh, funders as a tool to support Indigenous communities during the, the crisis. And well, this fund itself uh, was created in response to COVID-19. Um, it's actually not a temporary initiative, rather it was conceived as a long-term instrument um, intended to uh, contribute to the resilience of indigenous communities and it really has grown to become a, a, a big pillar of uh, indigenous phil philanthropic infrastructure. We also looked at the GIT5 and this was uh, also an early initiative among Can Canadian, um, mostly private, but also some community foundations, uh, which aimed to ask foundations to pledge at least 5% of their assets uh, through charitable grants during 2020 in response to the pandemic. Um, so the rationale behind the GIT5 campaign was that uh, community organizations were facing declined um, resources while also uh, looking at increased, increased dem demand for services. 
service um, and therefore grant making community had a responsibility to complement uh, some of these disbalances. Um, so the goal of GIF5 was to have at least 100 foundations to sign up for the pledge. Uh, this wasn't fully um, achieved, uh, but uh, it nevertheless did important work in um, raising questions around the disbursement quota and um, really contributed to conversations such as the other 95. And in the end, the fourth case study, uh, it was meant to examine collaborations between private and community foundations, uh, but we ended up looking at uh, some much broader issues of the role and mandate of um, grant making foundations in a changing society. So today I will uh, present a summary of our findings, but uh, actually all four case studies have short uh, reports available at the fill up website, so I can share um, these um, the links later in the chat if anyone is interested to uh, to look at these a bit more in detail. If we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, thanks. Um, so one of the key components of uh, foundation responses, uh, especially during the early days of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, was this greater uh, reliance on um, local expertise uh, to guide e emergency programming. What our case studies identified uh, is basically several examples of uh, grant making foundations uh, which turn to local leaders and uh, trusted collaborators of the organization with the purpose of um, allocating funds to communities. So the rationale behind this approach was to have community partners and really local people uh, decide uh, where emergency support should go in a timely manner. Apart from ensuring um, a really rapid availability of funding to local communities, um, this approach really allowed for foundations to uh, tap into local expertise and uh, really um, make sure that funding is tailored to, to local needs. So for example, the Lawson Foundation um, had established pop-up granting teams, uh, which were composed of local trusted individuals um, that were made responsible for distributing emergency aid to local organizations. Usually, um, even the organizations themselves that were receiving the funds were un unaware of the incoming support. And most of these funds were actually allocated outside the foundation's strategic impact areas and really focused on supporting food banks, make mental health support, shelters, um, and so on. And I think that um, this, uh, this um, move towards, um, um, let's say, uh, priority funding um, was um, was similar throughout the, the all of the examples that, that we looked at. On a similar note, for example, the MasterCard Foundation um, set up an indigenous leadership and insight circle, uh, which was comprised of um, indigenous leaders and also, uh, which were also meant to guide the, their COVID-19 recovery and resilience program. However, I would, say, I would say that perhaps the most notable example of uh, foundation reliance on community expertise um, is the Indigenous Peoples Resilience Fund. So here, uh, an Indigenous advisory group um, actually had full authority to define both the priorities as well as the uh, operating procedures of a fund. So um, all of these changes in a way marked the shift to a model of philanthropy that was more uh, grantee and community led uh, and where foundations um, really uh, abandoned predetermined approaches and objectives and um, really relied on local groups and communities to decide what is best for, uh, best for them. Apart from um, explicitly setting up these advisory groups or local groups to lead their um, or to, to help their um, emergency um, allocations. Um, the local leadership in the pandemic response um, also came um, to light as a result of uh, the reestablishment of restricted as, and as unrestricted funding. Uh, so as um, um, foundations moved, uh, some foundations moved to uh, allow um, organizations to use um, um, restricted funding as they uh, see fit. They once again uh, allowed for more bottom-up programming and also gave great, um, author greater authority to grantees to allocate funding as they see fit, which includes both their support for local communities and how they wanna adjust programs uh, to respond to, to community needs, but also to, um, 
in adjusting and using these funds for uh, the operational needs of their organizations. So overall, um, throughout the crisis, we can say that there was an increased flexibility, at least from, from the case studies and the examples that we saw, um, that there was an increased flexibility uh, to better support grantees, um, as well as the changing priorities um, in the community. And well, this adjustment was initially meant to serve a temporary uh, purpose uh, during the emergency created by the crisis. It still represents an important uh, change in funding practices. And um, it's an interesting, um, 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 just a, a idea to, uh, to look at it a bit more in detail uh, and what are its implications as we go forward. Can we move to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so um, the second component um, that was uh, prevailing throughout uh, our, um, our case studies was also the loosened rules and regulations. And um, this is basically increased fle flexibility of foundations and um, a bit greater power in the hands of grantees. Um, um, which was complemented with either reduced or fully suspended application and reporting um, requirements. Um, so in part, these, um, uh, these reduced um, or um, removed application and reporting uh, uh, requirements were um, adjustments made to complement the move from restricted to unrestricted funding, uh, but also as a way to reduce the administrative and management burdens to, to organizations and just ensure that community um, resources and organizational resources can really be directed to program operations rather than um, administrative tasks. So uh, while it is important to know that note that uh, application and reporting requirements are really important part of ensuring accountability, control, and uh, effectiveness in the sector, uh, at the same time, uh, um, we need to know that the administrative burden of completing these procedures ha has often been uh, a considerable strain, especially for smaller and less professionalized organizations. Uh, so in a way, taking a step back from these requirements uh, may provide uh, just the perspective of uh, what are the key purposes that these tools need to achieve and um, whether uh, a bit less complex and less robust requirements and maybe more effective in um, achieving these purposes. Next slide. So another set of findings um, revolved around collaboration and learning. Um, so I, our interviews showed that uh, funders have really prioritized uh, joint ventures and relied greatly on already established co collaborations, networks, and uh, pre-existing pre partnerships as uh, readily available solutions. Um, additionally, philanthropic learning has also emerged as an important component of um, um, a few of the actions that were um, quite a few of the actions that were taken by the funders we spoke to. So most of the funder initiatives we examined were collaborative in nature, um, like they were multi-funder efforts and um, these partnerships in a way have allowed foundations to make more substantial contributions to local communities and to emergency issues uh, while also decreasing operati operating costs and increasing the, the amount that is available to grantees. Um, these co collaborations have also facilitated a swifter exchange of information. Um, they were a way to ensure that funders complement each other rather than double efforts. Collaborations also um, for some funders presented with the opportunity to identify and pursue additional opportunities for joint action, which included uh, more complex and large scale issues and um, that funders were able to raise uh, and are, are otherwise unable to, take, to tackle independently. That being said, um, our interviews also showed that previous collaborations, trust and mutual respect were core attributes that allowed many of these initiatives to develop quickly. For example, this was the case with the Indigenous Peoples Resilience Fund, where established networks, collaborations and previous conversations really contributed to the swift establishment of, um, of a really big um, and really complex um, project within a very limited time frame. Throughout the initiatives um, that were taken uh, by uh, foundations, we also noticed uh, a common emphasis on learning and growth. 
as well as uh, developing and defining um, best practices. So for example, an important element of um, the IPRF, the Indigenous Peoples Resilience Fund in the early um, process of its establishment uh, was the existence of a funder's table, uh, which basically functioned as a forum for the exchange of information um, and ensuring foundations do not duplicate efforts, they can join forces and they can learn from the process of setting up the fund. In this sense, it is very interesting to note that uh, while some of the donors involved in the IPRF funders table um, eventually did not take part in the fund, at least in the beginning, they somehow remained uh, engaged in these conversations, uh, potentially pointing to the, uh, once again, to this, um, um, this uh, prevalence of, um, of uh, learning uh, and uh, um, exchange um, between funders. Another example um, of uh, this learning-oriented approach uh, is um, some are some of the initiatives developed by the, by the Lawson Foundation. Uh, so the Lawson Foundation, since the early days of uh, the pandemic, actually removed their uh, application and um, reporting requirements um, in an attempt to uh, to reduce the burden for their partners. Uh, and also um, moved uh, um, from restricted to unrestricted funding. Um, however, in spite of canceling uh, most of their uh, application and reporting requirements, uh, they still uh, kept uh, very short reports from grantees whose purpose was not to, uh, to elicit grantee accountability, but rather to learn from these programs and altered practices. So while all, um, you know, um, organizational learning is definitely an important component uh, of the sector and has always been, uh, it might also suggest uh, perhaps a lack of uh, best practices um, in facilitating emergency aid uh, and the lack of guidance um, that foundation felt that they had in this regard. Next slide. Um, so the last, um, common feature that we identified through these case studies uh, is uh, the uh, attempt to balance uh, short-term rapid responses with a more strategic application of emergency funding. And this was present actually in several of the initiatives we looked at. Um, however, um, and this is a tension that is um, this has been the focus of various conversation, uh, in conversations in this past year, but it is interesting to see that uh, the different initiatives we examined actually uh, they decide, uh, decided to approach and address these tensions in different ways. Uh, so for the Lawson Foundation, for example, the balance consisted of funds being uh, released gradually. In other words, uh, early funding was meant to respond to emergency needs, regardless of the foundation's strategic areas, while later funding was tailored to uh, provide support to community partners, uh, while also being in line with, um, with more um, strategic organizational uh, uh, commitments. On the other hand, uh, the IPRF uh, decided to approach uh, sol solving this tension differently. Uh, so despite recent concerns and the urgency in the early days of the pandemic, uh, the IPRF uh, decided to take some time to develop uh, a long-term decision-making infrastructure, strategic guidelines, and uh, really work out their grant-making procedures before dispensing any funds, which was a bit different than um, the approaches we, we saw elsewhere. Uh, this was a rather quick process. They were still able to, uh, to dispense funding as early as June, actually, I believe, uh, but it nevertheless uh, delayed the immediate availability of, um, of support from the IPRF. So going forward, it would be really interesting to see what the strengths and weaknesses of, these, um, of each of these approaches are when it comes to emergency funding and uh, whether this friction between responding to urgent needs and ensuring strategic effectiveness of scarce resources um, um, is um, and how is it connected to, to the philanthropic responses in emergencies. Um, therefore, the usefulness of both models um, really should, uh, should be looked at um, through further, uh, further studies. Next slide. Um, so overall, um, our analysis showed some um, general uh, changes to the dominant uh, philanthropic practices, at least in the early days of the pandemic. And uh, we have tried, uh, I have tried to summarize them here. Um, in, uh, in uh, four uh, tendencies. Uh, so for one, uh, throughout the crisis, there was a prominence of initiatives that uh, relied on greater trust um, in grantees and greater flexibility in the funder-grantee -grant relationship. 
So trust and flexibility um, were exemplified through the move from restricted to unrestricted funding, uh, the reduction of re uh, application and reporting requirements, and the overall reliance on local expertise to guide the early phases of the pandemic response. As such, these were key traits of the foundational responses to the crisis. Uh, these practices also brought, brought greater empowerment for grantees as they allowed greater control of resources for organizations that are highly resource dependent and in this way uh, really contributed to, to the um, empowerment of these organizations. Uh, and at least temporarily, these changes have made room for a more collaborative and equal re relationship between funders and grantees. So overall, this transition from project-based to core funding, the institution of linear administrative procedures, and the movement from a funder-directed development toward a grant-making relationship that is more bottom-up and community-directed. Uh, so in a way, these adjustments make us uh, mark a step back from the top-down tendency to direct, streamline, and rationalize community organization, and in this way, it, um, reduce the power disbalance um, towards a more equitable uh, relationship. This shift also allowed for resilience and innovation um, as uh, the sector really struggled to respond to increased demands while facing also declining resources. Um, some of the initiatives we looked at also raised issues around the policies that regulate philanthropic giving, and this was especially the case with, uh, with the Give5 initiative, uh, which even though it was temporary, it sort of raised uh, some of these issues around uh, um, the policies that mandate uh, grant-making foundations um, um, and their giving. Uh, so these in this includes the questions around the dis uh, disbursement quota and also the tension between spending down philanthropic assets um, and uh, the concept of uh, philanthropic foundations existing in uh, perpetuity. Um, so, um, um, if you could just wrap it up really quickly, yes. you have 20 minutes. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, uh, we can go to the last slide, actually, as I'm done. Uh, so, uh, I would say that in the end, uh, the long-term implications of um, these temporarily altered approaches to over accountability, program effectiveness, and community empowerment um, warrant further study. Um, the question is, um, if, is it possible for a more flexible partnership-oriented model of collaboration between funders and grantees uh, to be more uh, conducive to philanthropic work in, as we try to achieve equity in social justice? Um, at the same time, uh, these other type of support may also contribute uh, more sustainability for community support systems and grassroots initiatives that have really proven to be um, essential during the crisis um, and really make room for a more locally guided and uh, self-empowering um, uh, um, community action. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that presentation. That was super interesting. And I think we'll have a lot of complementarities with the next presentation that's coming up. Um, so um, we're going to hear next from Paloma Rego, who is going to be presenting some of the um, uh, findings of the COVID-19 and philanthropy Delphi studies. So I'll pass it over to Paloma for a 20-minute presentation. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Paloma Rago. I am a faculty at uh, Carleton University and with my colleagues, Kristen Pugh, Susan Phillips and Callie Madison. Uh, we have been working in partnership with uh, Philanthropic Foundation Canada and Community Foundations of Canada um, on this research project over the last year. Um, in this project, we are trying to understand um, how foundations reacted over the entire year. So I'll get say into uh, the specifics of the ways in which, I apologize, I'm trying to send, the ways in which uh, we did this. And, and uh, um, if you have more questions about the methodology, and I think that's a really interesting part of this project, feel free to, um, to ask uh, after. And um, today I will, present the sample just to give you a, a, an idea of the scope of the, the study. I'll discuss the methodology, which is a Delphi process that um, we have adopted and then further developed throughout the last year and, and show you some of the early findings. And I don't, we don't have all the, the data analyzed yet because we literally, 
um, did the last round a few weeks ago. So this is very much uh, work in progress. And in terms of participant samples, so overall we talked about, uh, we created these panels. So 21 foundations were in our set of panelists that we called. Um, and these panelists answered questions every six weeks or so about uh, various topics, which I'll talk about. So we had um, different organizations, community foundation, DAFs, public foundations, and uh, private foundations. Um, the idea of creating uh, this panel was to track over time uh, their responses. In terms of methodology, more specifically, we used uh, what is called a Delphi process. And uh, this process is quite interesting because it's um, a combination, if you want, of using surveys in a way that's very iterative. Um, so we sent, the idea here is simple, is that we sent uh, questionnaires to people who have expertise in their field, and in our case, um, in their foundations that have a good sense of what's happening. They give uh, an answer which we analyze. So every round, every session, that we did over the year um, will have this specific format. So we have the questionnaire developed based on theories and threats that we have observed. We send the questionnaires uh, to our panelists, our 21 panelists, they answer. We as a research team analyze the answers, code the data uh, within a day or two, and then we create a new questionnaire, which we send back within the same week. Uh, people answer, and once the week is done, we call this a session, and once the session is done, we report back to our panelists and tell them about the trends uh, that we're observing in the data. So this process, we did six times over the last year. So we started May 2020, in we, uh, May 2020 and we ended in 2021. I, I have a typo there. So each round had two survey, each session had two surveys sent. In terms of themes, what did we ask um, these panelists over the entire year? So we asked several questions about um, their perceptions of change and how their work had changed the ways in which they adapted to the change. And we focused on not only um, broadly change defined, but also at the micro level within their organizations and their processes. We asked them questions about collaboration. We were curious to understand whether or not uh, during the pandemic there were more collaboration, less collaboration and the types of collaboration. We asked them question about the information and data um, from who are they getting their information, um, their facts, their data uh, in a time of crisis? For us, it was really interesting to, to understand whether or not it was really information flowing from their peers or whether or not they were looking at um, outside sources of information. Um, we asked them naturally uh, about their challenges and things in which uh, made their work more difficult. One theme that emerged at some point that we didn't necessarily include initially was this theme of diversity, equity, and inclusion. As we all know, the events of last July had really been a catalyst uh, within the sector to talk about issues uh, surrounding racial justice and more. And then we concluded, uh, uh, the sessions uh, with questions about their perspective in the future, how confident uh, did they feel about uh, the foundation sector. So today I, we have so much data uh, to analyze that uh, I cannot present you all of it, but if you have questions after, uh, I'm more than happy to uh, give you some hints of, of what we're finding. So to give you an example here in this chart, what it represents is each different bars represent a different session. So as I said before, each session was composed of two surveys that 
panelists did back to back. And so when asked how much has the work of your foundation changed as the result of the pandemic, we found that surprisingly, uh, the answers were consistent across time. So meaning each time we asked them, they repeated the same answers. Uh, and, and that's actually quite surprising when we do uh, surveys in general um, to observe such consistency. One interpretation could be that uh, in this case, uh, the pandemic affected many aspects of, of the foundation's work, but it wasn't necessarily as a game changer as the narrative that we're creating uh, right now around uh, changes brought on by the pandemic. Uh, we like to, to talk about how transformational, how it changed everything, it, it did change things, but perhaps not as profoundly as we would have expected. So on average here, people rated their change from zero, not at all, to 10, a great deal of change, to an average of six, um, with the, the median slightly uh, more conservative, actually, uh, around the five, meaning that at the end of the day, people perceive really middle of the road type of change. When asked the question about adaptation, and so again, this is a question we asked round after round, uh, sessions after sessions after sessions. We asked them overall, how adaptive would you say your foundation has been in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic? And what's interesting here in terms of adaptation is again, the consistency is really surprising, but the average here, the adaptation is much higher. Um, in, in an adaptation, a mean around eight. So if you see here the, the eight and with a median uh, also of eight. So one could think, yeah, sure. Everyone likes to think themselves as adaptive. Therefore, it's not that surprising. But what's interesting is when we start asking them about um, from a session to another, that's where we noticed and we found way less, much less uh, higher differences of change. So people from one session to the other noted little change, little adaptation. This points us to this idea of uh, the effects of the pandemic have been incremental and uh, the foundation per se have been very skillful at adjusting slowly over time. The interesting thing about a study like ours is that if we had done a survey, let's say imagine in May, in May 2020, and another survey in 2021, we would have seen um, very few, either, yes, there has been a lot of change and we would have mischaracterized this change as game changer. But with the data that we're seeing over time, we really are talking about an incremental uh, change in adaptation strategy overall. Um, in terms of adaptation, we were also curious about how they adapted and where did they innovate. And um, so when we asked the organization, how has your organization innovated during the pandemic? Um, many and a lot of the people mentioned innovating through their internal process. So a lot of the changes, adaptation and innovation has been done internally. It's not to say that they haven't changed the way in which they do business. And we see this in some of the data we've gathered that they are uh, implementing changes in the way they're granting and in, in the types of causes they are. But uh, when asked what's the biggest source of innovation, it's really internally. Um, another source really interesting that we thought uh, was in terms of innovation through partnerships. So it's not so much, um, and, and I'm not presenting all the data we have on uh, partnerships, but interestingly is um, 
foundations have noted that um, they are collaborating, partnering with about the same uh, level uh, as pre-pandemic. Some a little more, but on average, it's relatively uh, consistent. But what has changed in their answer, and that for us is really interesting, and, and we're going to uh, push this a bit further, is that they have deepened their collaboration. So over the last year, what happened was not a race to make sure that we find new partners to do things, but within the partnerships already existing is to uh, make sure that these partnerships work, that these relationships are uh, fully developed and implemented, um, and thus generating a greater engagement with the community. And so we found that process interesting rather than going wide, they were really going deep over this past year. Uh, apologize here. In terms of challenges, um, we all know that there were several challenges related to the pandemic. One of the most often discussed, and this has been a theme that came up particularly um, towards session four or five and the last one, is the pandemic related fatigue or anxiety. Um, and this is really a, an important reminder for us all to, to take care of our own. Um, there, there is a, a lot of mental health issues um, seeming to being, uh, that seem to be bubbling up. It would be important for foundations to, again, look inward and make sure that the people they employ are supported. Uh, this was by far the the most important concern and pressing concern. So the pandemic will definitely have a very important implication in, in terms of how we deal with human resources. And to a certain extent, uh, the trauma of the pandemic within our ranks. Another uh, important challenge has been adapting strategies in a changing environment. So as I mentioned before, what we've noticed is that change was really incremental. But when, when things change, con constantly adapting is also difficult. And it remains to be understood, why is this so challenging? Is it because uh, people have uh, what they call pandemic fatigue? Or is it because uh, at some point you realize that you are further or uh, in a different place and haven't had time really to adapt. You have changed, but haven't really solidified that change. Another important uh, challenge was the pace of work and workload management. Again, this ties back to this idea of people were doing more. <laughs> a lot of us thought entering the pandemic that uh, we would not necessarily be productive, we would do less. Uh, but we found quite the opposite, that people workload increased, um, pace of work increased, and particularly in the group of foundation we found, we discussed. Um, all these other concerns are important and the ways in which we uh, created this list was to ask an open-ended question in the first round of one session and then coding these answers and giving a list to our participants in order for them to select among the list. And these were the top three concerns. So pandemic fatigue, adapting in a changing environment and the pace of work and a workload management. One, one aspect that uh, came up uh, during uh, our year and that people started really talking and it was quite interesting for us as a research team to bring this into our research. Um, because uh, in July, when we were preparing uh, our round, we decided to say, hey, we should ask foundation about what's going on and the ways in which uh, they think about diversity, equity, and uh, racial justice. And this question was asked at the end. So this is just fresh off the, the press. Uh, we asked, 
Has your foundation increased its attention to social inequality, in inequities or community vulnerabilities over the past year? And um, of those who answered the question, 88% said yes. And um, at the beginning, when we started asking this question in July, people were expressing that the conversation were starting, that they were trying to think about ways in which they could uh, approach this subject. But we're seeing very much um, now uh, in the last round that we just concluded in April, that people were actually starting to concretely implement strategies, uh, try to find new ways to engage with a marginalized community members, population within their sphere of competency and within their sphere of activity. Um, this tells us that fundamentally, perhaps the pandemic in conjunction with the July event really allowed uh, this transformation, a deep transformation to happen to a certain extent. Um, and this is something we'll probe a bit more. Uh, in terms, we, we asked so many questions that I, I wish I had more time to present you all the data, but one thing that was really interesting when we asked um, our panelists to answer and rate their own boards uh, in terms of their own diversity. So we asked them uh, to rate from uh, one to 10, uh, to rate from excellent, good, weak or poor, uh, their, um, their diversity on these specific aspects. Well, what we learn here is that gender parity seems to be the most achieved, thank you, seems to be the most uh, achieved uh, diversity dimension within uh, those. Um, so more than 82% said good or more. What's a, a bit, uh, not shocking I say, but something to really think about is including people with lived experience on the board is really something that the sector uh, and this group at all maybe had not considered or are not doing per se. And so uh, more than 83% said they rated themselves either weak or really poor on that aspect. So there, there is obviously uh, some improvement that could be done in terms of racial and ethno-cultural, but lived experience is also, and as we know, these uh, can be uh, oftentimes overlap, is not something to, uh, to forget. Um, I won't necessarily elaborate on the mental health because I've already touched about, but I just wanted to conclude and say, um, the next step for our research, now we are conducting individual one-on-one -on -one interviews with uh, the, the panelists in our, uh, in our group to really probe more deeply and, and come back at the, uh, to them about their answers, their questions. And so we're trying to have a really more understanding of why they answered the way they did. Next week, we're hosting a roundtable forum where their identities to each other will be, really, uh, will be uh, revealed because throughout the process they were anonymous to each other. And there the opportunity will be to really talk about what all this means and reflect uh, about the year that has gone by. If you have any questions, feel free to email us um, and we're happy to talk more. Thank you, Kristen. Thanks. Um, it was really nice seeing you put this all together. Um, so thank you very much. Um, for our last presentation, we've got Megan Conway. And I'm so sorry, I forgot to introduce uh, Leah McCarroll, who is also going to be co-presenting on the role of, and capacities of community foundations. So Megan and Leah, take it away. Thanks, Kristen. And I'm just going to pull up my slide here. And I appreciated Paloma's uh, presentation because it touches on in, uh, lots of important themes related to change and adaptation, which I'm also going to talk about. So thank you, Kristen, and hi, everyone. Um, so today's presentation is about research that's very much so in process, 
um, related to the role of community foundations in identifying and um, responding to emergent change. So um, uh, I'm presenting on behalf of others in my research team who in include uh, Leah McCarroll, who's also gonna be joining today, as well as Dr. Alexander Williamson, um, who's from uh, Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, I think it's probably somewhere in the ballpark of 3.30 in the morning over there, as well as Dr. Susan Phillips. Some of what we're going to talk about in today's conversation, high level. And I just want to also acknowledge um, that uh, this research has been supported by PhiLab, and it's, as I mentioned, in a very early stage. Um, but broadly speaking, as a team of researchers, we had some core interests related to how community philanthropy and specifically community foundations um, identify, um, address, and mediate emergent uh, change. So um, we see the importance of the spatial turn within philanthropic scholarship, and we believe that there's a value in understanding what's happening within um, place-based philanthropy, um, which by its very nature makes, makes activities um, and philanthropic focus very local. We also um, saw there being an opportunity to think comparatively about some of the questions we were um, interested in. And we identified some significant gaps related to comparative research on community philanthropy and specifically comparative research that centers more squarely on the Canadian experience. Um, so in today's conversation, I'm going to talk through a very, very early stage conceptual model related to how community philanthropy and specifically community foundations might future proof themselves. Um, we're also interested in this notion of how community foundations can act as community leaders um, or thinking through different models of community leadership, especially models of community leadership that may be more present within times of crisis, uh, such as the one that we've been living through over the last 16 months. Um, and we're, we're curious about the capacities that community foundations need to play um, in, in operating as a consensus builder, as an advocate, as a convener, as a meaning maker, as a disruptor or a connector or a funder. So a little bit about uh, the two countries that we're speaking about um, or that I'm gonna speak to. Um, many of you probably, although it feels like a distant memory now, but many of you probably remember that um, in the very, very late stages of 2019 and into early 2020, Australia had some of the most um, wide ranging and uh, devastating bushfires that has, it has seen um, ever. And, and that we saw lots of images on the television and elsewhere around um, massive amounts of wildlife loss, as well as uh, major swaths of landscape that were burnt. Um, similarly, within the Canadian context, we've seen um, a, a very long experience related to COVID-19, and its impacts have been felt differentially in different types of communities and in different types of neighbourhoods over the last 16 months. But if you think about Canada and Australia, they're two very um, common, uh, they have common histories on many levels, so both are Commonwealth countries and they have um, similar government systems and, and similar ge geographies. Australia has a population base of approximately 25 million while Canada's is 37 million. And another um, comparative element is that both have pockets of urban centers around them as well as uh, huge swaths of, of rural landscape. So we felt that there was something there in terms of a comparative analysis to think through the experience in Canada and Australia. So specifically, um, we're interested in the role of community, community foundations in mediating um, place-based or emergent change. Um, rapid change destabilizes legitimacy and, and authority of community foundations. And we've seen over the last um, number of months, huge shifts in terms of the terrain related to what is considered um, status quo and, and what is um, considered quote unquote normal. So, um, there's been a, a shift towards a, a recognition of a Black Lives Matter uh, perspective and, and the importance of uh, BIPOC voices uh, being held more centrally in conversations, COVID-19 as a flag, as well as the bushfires and floods in Australia. And both countries have had um, a resurgence or a, a upswing in terms of the, the rise of a community foundation movement. And so when we started to look at some of those comparative pieces, we decided we would focus more squarely on the role of community foundations as intermediaries and specifically the peak bodies of those, um, of those organizations. So the two questions we've been interested in so far are what are the emergent challenges and opportunities facing community foundations and in what ways are the peak bodies for community foundations in Canada and Australia able to identify 
and implement strategies to address rapid and emergent change. And I think one of the other things I just wanna flag is that um, the research so far has been much more relational in terms of making some connections to those peak bodies, both in Canada and Australia, and also in terms of scoping out perceptions of change. There's very little research that actually looks at the role of intermediaries in um, addressing change and specifically philanthropic intermediaries. So we've developed a rough um, framework for consideration. And at this point, it's, it's tentative and conceptual, but we're thinking through questions of, you know, as many of us have experienced, um, the last year has focused all of us onto um, being very concentrated on hyper-local um, questions and hyper-local issues and the hyper-local experience. So um, how is that uh, emerging as a, of a frame, especially in relation to uh, opportunities to self-organize or to ground grassroots initiatives at a very um, um, minute and local scale. The other theme that we see emerging is that there's systems change happening both locally, nationally, and globally. So um, as I flagged, uh, paradigms feel like they're shifting and what the status quo is, is also shifting um, at, at different scales. And that's also impacting or uh, interacting with what's happening at the local. The other thing that has uh, another major trend that we see is emerging is this notion of um, shifting funding streams. So, um, you know, there's different pockets of money being uh, made available to communities in ways that has never happened before, and that those are being flown through uh, national intermediaries in ways that are unique and, um, and unprecedented in many ways. The other question or, or dynamic we see is that there's a new emergent collaboration and aligning with other funders. Um, happening within the same local space. So there has been um, enhanced or required collaboration at the local level with philanthropic bodies. So in terms of the methodology, um, we have focused on peak bodies or intermediaries, uh, Community Foundations of Canada, as well as Australia Community uh, Philanthropy. One thing to note is that um, the, size of those, uh, found, the, the size of those organizations is quite different. So while CFC has a number of staff um, and has um, a larger operation, it's important to note that Australia Community Philanthropy is much smaller um, and, and um, smaller in size. So maybe not smaller in its uh, impact, but definitely a smaller operating size as well as operating budget. And both of those organizations play important leadership roles in network building and strategy in learning and development across their members. Um, so they play important roles in terms of um, sharing knowledge and learning, convening important conversations, and weaving together partnerships with various funders or um, resource partners. In terms of the mission and mandate of CFC, they have 191 community foundations, and I'm pretty sure that grows almost at least monthly, it seems like, but they have large, a large representation of community foundations across Canada, and they see themselves as building a movement that connects community foundations um, for a just and sustainable future. And Australia Community Philanthropy supports a vibrant peer network of community philanthropy across Australia. Um, and so some of what we've done so far is to have very preliminary conversation with, with, with senior leaders in each of those two organizations. What was interesting, and these were very informal conversations and, and really much more focused on relationship building, but what was interesting in those conversations was a consistency in terms of uh, themes that emerged um, at both of those organizations. So one, one major theme that both organizations identified is the relevance or significance of natu uh, national partnership building, um, which was becoming a key strategy for success. So that was uh, definitely something that has happened within the Canadian context with the flow through money from the federal government on a number of fronts from um, um, uh, funding related to gender and women's issues, um, most notably the emergency support fund, uh, which has also been flown through community foundations of Canada, along with other national partners. And most recently, uh, CFC has also been a delivery partner in terms of a healthy communities initiative. So definitely um, national funding partnerships is emerging as a key theme. Comparably in Australia, on a number of key fronts, there, there has been a national partnership um, to support funding to flow through to community foundations from the national body in an enhanced way that has not been um, as, as practiced uh, in the past. That has raised a number of questions in terms of capacity and administration, and also in terms of resonance across the membership of community foundations. So um, big strategic investments are being made nationally, and then the question becomes how resonant is that initiative with the diverse membership of community foundations. 
Another emerging theme from these conversations has been um, a shift in terms of a focus on uh, inclusion and trust-based philanthropy, as well as an emergence of um, um, equity and diversity and inclusion perspectives as critical in, in terms of how community philanthropy must pivot to address um, some of these emerging trends that are happening within community. And I, I hesitate to use the word pivot because it seems like every time I do, someone just cringes at how um, overused that term has been over the last 16 months or something. But the other flag that I think I, I wanna um, note is that vital signs and this notion of identifying sources of knowledge that are relevant to understanding what is happening within local communities is another uh, common theme between two con both contexts. So um, the notion that both uh, Australia and um, Canada are looking for sources of credible, reliable data and knowledge to support grant making initiatives as well as the role as community leaders is another theme that emerged in our conversations. So I'm gonna hand the mic over to Leah, who's gonna talk through some of the methods that we've used as well as some of the data that's emerged in our very early and preliminary um, exploration so far. Thanks, Megan. So as Megan said, um, we uh, were in early stages and, and have been kind of more focused on uh, relationship building, um, getting a view of the landscape um, and getting a view of, of more of the comparative dimensions um, of the peak bodies in Canada and Australia. We've started to do a preliminary analysis of some content uh, that will be supplemented by a more robust content analysis uh, in the coming months. Um, and so the purpose of, of this most recent content analysis was really try to, trying to get a sense of whether or not the um, preliminary coding and categorization that we came up with was, uh, was right, um, really reflected what's, what's going on, um, at least at the surface from a social media perspective for these peak bodies. Um, and so that, that uh, coding uh, breakdown will inform our more robust content analysis that we'll be, that we'll be conducting. Um, so we decided for our content analysis to look back to September 9, 2019, so pre-pandemic, uh, so that we could capture um, any emergent changes with respect to things like the bushfires um, and floods in Australia, and, and to try and get a sense of whether or not there was um, shifting discourse or a shift in the nature of the content that was being promoted uh, via social media. In terms of data sources for our um, pending content analysis, we're looking at uh, the websites of these peak bodies, um, blog posts, annual reports, publications, uh, and then social media. So we focused in on Twitter for the moment. Um, but as I'll mention, uh, the, the degree to which the two peak bodies use Twitter differs. Uh, so that will obviously inform what other uh, sources we look at. In terms of our coding, we wanted to get a sense of um, what are the key issues to which uh, we would see community foundations and the peak bodies um, responding. So we, we came up with this categorization that includes public health, so anything related to community health, mental health, um, uh, health crises, so of course the pandemic, um, climate and environment as, as another emerging, well, not emerging issue, but another issue to which uh, uh, community foundations must respond. So climate change, natural disasters, uh, questions of sustainability, uh, structural inequality, so equity, empowerment, enfranchisement, anti-oppression. Um, we wanted to look at uh, welfare, so homelessness, youth welfare, poverty, living wages, et cetera. Uh, and then any, any trends uh, with respect to um, changing philanthropic um, demands. Um, so specific to sector best, best practices, uh, policy changes that would uh, influence um, how philanthropic organizations respond and specifically communi community foundations respond. Uh, what kinds of partnerships um, are showing up? So with business and government and then other philanthropic organizations in the space. And then um, the final category is internal processes. So of course, just the, the regular um, kind of cycle of talking about grants, hiring events and publications uh, that don't necessarily highlight a specific um, community issue, but rather keep audiences up to date on, on what's going on internally at the peak bodies and then at, uh, at community foundations in turn. So when we were looking at our coding, and of course this will 
um, likely evolve as we go into a more robust content analysis, but we wanted to first um, get a sense of whether the content is talking about a local versus a national issue and or international, of course, and, and how they're, they conceptualize and define um, whether the issue is, is local or national. And then we wanted to look at the purpose of the post. And, and the reason for this is so that we can build a scale um, and kind of an engagement scale of whether um, community foundations in their posting about uh, issues or changes are engaging in simple awareness raising or sharing of information, whether they're calling um, community foundations and their other audiences to action, or whether they're engaging in partnership building. And some could be a combination. Um, they're not mutually exclusive categories necessarily, but we uh, have already seen a lot of posts just based on our preliminary scanning that would fall into um, any of these three categories. So in terms of our preliminary findings, uh, what we did was um, essentially took the uh, Twitter posts from Canadian um, Community Foundations of Canada and Australian Community Philanthropy, just to do a preliminary analysis of what kinds of things they're talking about on their Twitter feed. Um, I will I'll note that uh, we do know that um, ACP isn't as active on Twitter. Of course, they do tweet, but they're, the community foundations that they represent are more active on Facebook. So that's something uh, we will likely explore in our um, in our content analysis. But this was really to to give us a sense of what are the high level um, areas that that community foundations or, or peak bodies are calling on community foundations to look at or respond to. Uh, so you can see that um, for, for CFC, structural inequality um, was uh, the main, uh, the bulk of the tweets that were, were coming up since September 2019. Um, especially, uh, we, we saw that number rise um, over the course of the summer um, and has seemed to be a pretty stable um, theme throughout tweets um, since, since last summer. And then we see um, for, um, for ACP, climate and the environment uh, was kind of the dominant theme that was showing up in tweets. So anything related to the bushfires, um, that was obviously a very, um, a very prominent area of focus for ACP, um, floods as well as sustainability. We are also seeing that, of course, public health for CFC um, came in second in terms of the frequency. Okay, so we're, we're rounding up to our, our two minutes. Um, so in terms of the frequency, uh, so um, counter to ACP, uh, where there's just a 2%, um, and that was really just talking about COVID and no other kind of uh, issues related to health, such as mental health, community health, et cetera. So this, we just found this a, a compelling first step into guiding uh, the rest of our analysis. Um, again, these are just some word clouds that, uh, that were created from the Twitter feeds and, and show some of the key themes that came up in our preliminary findings. Um, of course, we, we recognize that in this research, we're assuming social media is a proxy for peak bodies, voice, and strategic direction. So that will, of course, um, need to be complemented by our, our content analysis in the next steps. And, uh, and that will happen through um, annual reports, publications, um, as well as likely future interviews to kind of corroborate what we're seeing. Um, and maybe I'll pass it back to Megan. Sure. And so um, we're really at the stage of needing to do more analysis, but also having more questions uh, around the data and more observations. But we're curious about whether or not peak bodies, what the tension is between day to day business and crisis focus and how um, the perception of change and the response or adaptation to change um, has uh, required a shift in strategy related to those two ends of the, uh, or dimensions. Um, we're curious also about how crises destabilize um, how philanthropic people peak bodies operate? And if so, how and what capacities do those peak bodies need to have in terms of response um, and, and uh, recovery from a crisis or a disaster? And then um, do um, how do philanthropic bodies redefine community or double down? Or do they do double down on this notion of traditional um, community leadership and community philanthropy roles? And then another in emerging question we have is, given the diversity of members in both uh, you know, community foundations, 
how do philanthropic peak bodies mobilize around critical issues and specifically what strategies do they use to um, build consensus and mobilize uh, around a specific agenda? Um, Sorry, your 20 minutes if you could wrap up. That'd be that's great. great. We're, we're, we're at the end and, um, and that's essentially it for us. And, and uh, those are some questions we have rather than more fulsome uh, concrete answers, but we uh, were interested in continuing the exploration. Thanks, Kristen. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, really interesting presentation and I'm excited to see where this project goes. If I could get all three, all four of the presenters to um, turn on your video once again, we'll start the Q and A. Um, there are a couple of different ways that you can ask questions for this. Um, one, you can type in the chat, um, just uh, put Q at the beginning so that I know you're asking a question and not commenting. Um, and then I can read out the question, or if you are super keen to read out the question yourself, you're very welcome to do so by just either typing question in the chat and I'll know to, to sort of point to you, um, or you can even sort of um, raise your hand in the um, reactions function and I will try to look at that as well. So if anybody has any questions, you can start with that. Perfect, we've got one for Paloma. Um, so uh, this is from Megan um, asking, what does, does the type of foundation matter in the Delphi study? Type or size, Paloma? So does size or type matter? So, so that, that's definitely something that uh, we are starting to play with because um, we do have information on uh, their size, the type, and we're trying to understand uh, whether their questions, whether their answers vary uh, according to that. Uh, initial hints are that it, it does matter. Um, so just, just in the, the diversity questions, for example, we know that uh, private foundation um, have uh, much more to go to reach uh, some uh, diversity uh, parameters that are uh, at par or, or close to than uh, community foundations, for example. And we also think that change, our, our intuition here, and, and we have to start really delving into the quantitative uh, analysis part of it, is that uh, size will matter, that a smaller organization might perceive change much more greatly than larger organization, but that's still to explore. Uh, but it's definitely a, a dimension we're looking in. What we are trying to do also with the data, because we have trend data over a year, we want to understand how that affects the trend over that year. So our small foundation uh, noticing the same level over the year, or is it changing differently? So. But for, for now, we don't have, I, I cannot, maybe Kristen, uh, have you, you've played a bit? A little bit, yeah. It seems as though community foundations are quite different from private foundations, but beyond that, what you said was right, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, um, anybody else have a question? Otherwise, I will shoot some. Uh, oh, here we go. This is a question for Megan and Leah um, from Oscar Barron. Is there any part of your research focused on the impact of the pandemic um, that on the impact the pandemic has had on the support community foundations give to access post-secondary education or even in the equity on accessing post-secondary education? That's a great question, Oscar. And at this point, that hasn't emerged in terms of our analysis. Um, I think it's what your question also highlights or flags is. Um, what's urgent and emergent in terms of requiring focus versus other critical issues that might not be um, center or um, uh, represented in dominant discourse or in public discourse. So I think um, the extent to which that's an important issue, I think is, I, I, you know, I definitely see there being relevance uh, to that issue. It's just not something that's emerged in terms of the dominant discourse we've started to analyze at this point. But thank you for flagging it, because I think it does speak to this question of what's dominant and what becomes peripheral, especially in moments of crisis. I'm sure, Leah, do you have anything to add on that? Um, no, I mean, I would just say as well, um, with CFC, we do see um, a large focus on youth just from our preliminary analysis, but whether that translates to specific youth issues in terms of the discourse, uh, that hasn't necessarily come through. It's just more of youth as a, as a general um, 
segment of the population. So that's a, a great uh, point, Oscar. Thanks. Awesome. Um, I have a question for Isadora. Um, so I was really um, interested to hear that. Um, it sounded to me anyway, like a lot of what was happening with these foundations is a decentering of power um, and a movement to empower communities. And I'm curious um, in terms of what you found so far, um, first of all, um, am I characterizing that correctly? And secondly, if so, um, do you think it's likely to endure or is that something that sort of happened in the crisis that might um, revert back to status quo afterwards? That's a great question. Thank you so much, Christine. Uh, yes, you're, you're definitely interpreting that correctly. Uh, I didn't have much time to sort of elaborate. Of course, this is, um, I mean, this was a sort of a series of really short case studies. They were exploratory in nature. So they really, um, you know, the data cannot really give us the confidence to generalize too much. From, but from what we saw, uh, we can definitely see how these practices actually uh, really affect the, the, the relationship and the power balance between the, uh, between the, the two groups. Um, is that here to stay? I, I couldn't say really. I think that uh, one of the, this, this remains sort of the one of the action points for further research, um, even though we're just going through, so we just did like a second round of follow-up interviews. Uh, and um, it seems that even though, you know, some, there are some, uh, some of them are, uh, some, there are some steps back, uh, it seems that there is still room for, um, you know, embracing some of these changes, but I think it, it will be a process and it will depend on the, on the foundation itself, of course, uh, and, uh, and, and different uh, types of traits of these organizations. So uh, hopefully it might be something to explore in the future. Great. Um, I've got a couple of questions that came in. I'll do the one from Jean-Marc Fontaine first, um, because he typed it first. Uh, so both Isadora and Paloma report changing behaviors or thinking from grant-making foundations. Um, from what you hear or observe in your research, will those changes survive the pandemic? Um, will this be a platform for more changes to come, or will it become business as usual a few months from now? So I guess a slightly wider version of the question I already asked Isadora, but also for Paloma. <laughs> Isadora, before, I guess I'll give you the floor again, just in case you want to add anything to what you said. But. Um, no, I think I will leave the floor to Paloma for this one. So it, 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 it's a good question. And interestingly, we ask the people that question. So we had a question, does your foundation plan to retain these change going for, forward? So if you remember, we asked them uh, for six, session, the same question. Um, and all those who answered said yes, that they would uh, keep uh, these change. Um, I think uh, we have discussed this as a, a group, whether or not uh, these are <laughs> gateway changes in a way, you know, the, the first change, then you get hooked to the change. Uh, the fact that they are uh, changing the in really trying to integrate um, the, the work they're doing on diversity, equity, uh, tells you that, that there is a really profound reflection going on. One of the things that was interesting, we asked them also, since the beginning of the pandemic, has your foundation changed where it funds? Um, and whether it, this is a wider or more targeted uh, geographic area. And it goes back to this idea of uh, not necessarily broader, but deeper. And 71% uh, uh, of our panelists said no, that uh, they don't necessarily, they, yeah, it, it hasn't changed where they fund. But I think later we get at what their funding is starting to change. And so that's, that's uh, promising. Yeah, I'll also maybe add just quickly um, that what um, I was hearing, at least in some of our wrap up interviews, is that for some foundations, um, the crisis was actually a bit more of a consolidation of changes they're already making. Um, and it really reaffirmed for them that diversity, equity, and inclusion, things that they were already acting on were really good movements. And so they were able to sort of entrench that further. So uh, yeah, really, um, really interesting answers from you guys. Thank you. I've got a question from David Lasby here. Um, so for Megan and Leah, do you have any plans to compare discourse with how funding is allocated? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, David. I think one of the important things we're recognizing is that 
we need to understand the extent to which discourse is um, impacting it on in terms of actions and or strategy shifts. So we're trying to determine what our next step will look like in terms of uh, data collection and analysis related to that. Grant making is one measure that that may be able to, to tell us, but it doesn't necessarily speak to adaptive capacities and or um, how plans are shifting. So one piece is also pulling strategic plans and identifying whether the focus has shifted in those and how um, issues are being conceptualized to be addressed within uh, some of those documents. So those are steps to come for sure. Awesome, glad to hear it. Um, so we've got a question from Nancy Pohl um, and this question for Paloma and Isadora. Uh, so did any of your studies look at other aspects of foundations activities beyond the grant making and grantee community relation function and focus? So for example, shifts in investment policy, shifts in convening and policy dialogue roles. Um, we'll maybe start with Isadora because you haven't spoken in a little while. Sure, uh, thanks so much. Um, uh, unfortunately, our, our study didn't really um, didn't really identify some of those. So um, what we did basically was um, we went out to see what for foundation how foundations have responded to COVID nineteen and most of the sort of the initiatives and uh, changes we identified uh, actually related to uh, to these more hands on sort of uh, practical initiatives and more related to their relationship with grantees. Um, however, I I also think that um, you know this was done rather early so this was just done just in may uh so i would say that probably um because i believe that the changes were you know there are notable changes in other areas as well but possibly this was done to, too early to uh, to note uh, those changes yes back in may 2020 and we thought this would be over by september uh Paloma, yeah. how about you? <laughs> it, uh, hi nancy i hope you're well um <laughs> What's what's interesting? I think it's a it's an interesting question because we have talked about this a lot. Where uh, you know, Kristen, Susan, uh, and Kelly and I, um, because we asked them uh, how much they um, interact with policymakers and you know what level. We had all these very sophisticated questions to know exactly what you're asking. And what we found was, in yeah, I, I guess I'm I'm still curious about is that they do not. They, uh, in general, don't engage with the policy process or policy makers, which, you know, personally makes me wonder, uh, is there an opportunity missed here uh, for many of them? And, you know, uh, is it the next step of them stepping up in, into that sphere to really enact change? But uh, it, it, I was quite baffled how little they did uh, policy work, but we, we did ask them uh, questions about uh, disbursement quota, which is, you know, on everyone's mind right now. Uh, and many of them thought that it, uh, they, we asked them to identify the, the optimum uh, disbursement quota. Some were all the way to 10 and more, 10% and more. And on average, people settled uh, around 5%, but many noted that they uh, did more than that actually in practice or restriction on, on qualified donees and how would that affect their work. Many noted that if uh, restrictions uh, on non-qualified donees were relaxed, they would be able to do uh, much more work uh, and uh, increase uh, their impact of their work. So I, I thought that was interesting. Definitely. We've got a uh, question from Todd Jacks. Um, so uh, given that they served as funding conduits, um, any analysis of how these messages, I guess the messages of foundations align or differ relative to their respective government messages? Um, so I think that's maybe a question for Megan and Leah, um, but if other people have answers as well. Um, we'll yeah, and I think, um the, so one observation that we've had just uh, in conversation around that is that the action of um, distributing government funds at a national scale is a is a pretty political act, and that um, the degree to which that relationship needs to be um, managed and um, how reciprocal it is, I think, is a question. 
Um, and it's also highly dependent on who's in who's in charge politically or who the government is. So there could be some potential vulnerabilities in that strategy. On the other hand, it does open up um, potential new sources of revenue. And in terms of um, the analysis, that hasn't happened yet, but we do want to uh, spatialize where some of the emergency support, the emergency community support funds um, have gone and look at um, are there patterns spatially in that, that in that in terms of which communities were recipients and which weren't. Um, and another component to this, just in terms of high level, my understanding in conversation with CFC anyways, that the learning has been quite adapt uh, iterative in terms of how that flow through funding has gone and that, um, you know, that's been, um, it's opened up uh, their own transformation agenda as well around developmental evaluation and thinking through how they um, both uh, implement it and also um, adapt on the fly related to that type of um, major government in initiative. So good question though. Thanks, Todd. Uh, Leah, would you like to add anything? No, all right. Uh, and Paloma Isadora, um, no. Okay, cool. We'll go on to Manuel Italian's question, which is for Paloma. Um, so he asks, how much movement have we seen at the board level during the pandemic? New recruits, reforms? Tell us. It's quite interesting. So we actually did ask them, um, has, your board, has your board done anything to change your organization, its work as a result of the pandemic? And we got a split down the middle. 50% said yes, 50% said no. Um, when we asked them more specifically, uh, what did they do uh, in terms of change or not? Uh, we, we have interesting answers. One, one group of answers really focused on proposing new initiatives, thinking outside the box. Um, but another group of answer also focused on changes in, which, in, in the ways in which decisions are made. Um, and that relates to some of the findings that we found in terms of pace of the work. And many found it necessary to, um, to loosen a bit uh, the grip and, and leave more latitude uh, on the operational side. Um, and so, but, but it doesn't mean that the board actually became uh, disengaged. Uh, some, and again, we have these two groups. It's almost like a, a U. On one a group says that the, they wish their board was more involved, more present. The other one, uh, their board was great, really involved. And so I think, you know, it's, it's really, it's going to be interesting when we start looking by size and by type to understand these difference. But we are seeing uh, that people, uh, that boards have changed and adapted in, in ways in which um, our are more leadership, less hands-on in, in trying to give control. So it's gonna be interesting for us to, to follow up with boards that have failed to do that. What are the impacts? And, and I suspect based on other research that I'm doing that that will have a highly negative impact on organization. Great. Um, I've got a question for Megan and Leah. Um, I'm curious, so I think the most striking slide of your presentation for me anyway was those pie charts um, where, um, if I'm not mistaken, the biggest wedge for Canada was um, on sort of like structural inequalities and in Australia it was climate change. And I'm just curious, um, I know you talked a little bit about the bushfires, but do you think that represents sort of like a broader focus or was it more about sort of the moment at which you were researching in both countries? Um, curious about that. I'll let Leah jump in on that one. That is a great question and I think um, because we took a, a slice of time that went before the pandemic, we could in a preliminary sense maybe extrapolate that it's more than just a moment in time. Um, but it's, it's hard to say at this point, um, given that we haven't gone a little bit deeper into the analysis to say, okay, is this just um, resharing a post that's talking about a specific issue of structural inequality, or is it actually talking about a CFC initiative focused on structural inequality? Um, and is it calling people to action? So I think the extent to which we can kind of um, hypothesize about whether it represents something bigger um, is pretty, pretty low right now, but that's hopefully what we'll be able to um, maybe make some observations about once we get a little bit deeper. For sure, I'm looking forward to seeing it. 
Um, I've got a question for Paloma as well. Um, so one of the things, <laughs> because I'm on this project, I get to ask you about things you didn't even present on, but <laughs> one of the things that we asked uh, foundations about was sort of looking at phases of adaptation. I'm curious if you can maybe tell the audience about what those phases were and uh, what we learned about that. Yeah, interesting because, um, thanks Kristen. <laughs> we, uh, when we were talking about, uh, we started talking about this really in, in July, around July, because we were thinking uh, the ways in which um, organizations in general adapt during a crisis has to vary uh, along how the crisis unfold. So, you know, and, and so if we think of a crisis at the beginning, there's the shock period, um, there's a transition period and change. And so we um, decided to, uh, to ask people about these phases. So we had a emergency response, a transitional phase, uh, an adaptation phase, another transitional, and then a reinvention, if I'm correct. I, I might be missing one, but, but what was interesting is at first, and that's, that's maybe the way we were thinking about it, is that um, people were uh, a lot in the emergency, but also all over the place. And what we realized when talking about this is that um, this process of adaptation happens at different level of the organization. So whether it's, let's say, in, in the communication side, you might be in a different phase than in another part of your organization. And so that's a complexity that we'll need to deal with. But overall, we did see some movement at the beginning when we started asking a lot more organizations were in the emergency phase. And in this, the, the last session, uh, we're moving more towards a transitional, very few are on, I think only one was like, yeah, we have reinvented ourselves. So, so people were very kind of in the process of. Great. Um, so I think we've got only about one more minute. So I'm wondering if maybe I could get everybody on the panel to give a really quick answer to a question. Um, if there was sort of like one thing that you think is the most important thing out of your project so far, or the most interesting thing, um, what would that be for you? And whoever has the quickest thought to it could start because I know sometimes this can be hard. Um, I'll go first. Um, one of the most interesting things I think is in, uh, despite the differences between Canada and Australia in terms of what the crises were, both um, national bodies had similar response strategies. I think for, for us, there's, it's a hard question because I think there are so many interesting things. <laughs> Uh, but uh, our project's fantastic, no. <laughs> uh, but what I think is particularly interesting is this uh, deepening of community engagement. Uh, I found that pre pretty striking as um, it's to take the time to get to know your partner, invest in that part. And it's almost pre-pandemic we were just busy doing the work and now uh, this offered an opportunity to stop, think, reflect, and uh, as uh, Kristen was saying, to kind of regroup uh, to the next step. And that I find particularly interesting. Thank you. Uh, so um, I think for me, uh, it's just this understanding that, um, you know, uh, this the, this tendency that uh, I think is overall uh, exists in society around rationalizing and prof uh, professionalizing and sort of controlling uh, the work of organizations, uh, basically based on the idea that you know greater racialization and control will actually bring like more effective 
um, more effective charitable work. And it seems that once, um, at least in this situation, which was really a specific situation, but um, really this more relaxed, uh, more equal and more collaborative partnership was what was needed to, to actually get to this effectiveness fast. So for me, the question is like in what form, it what in what shape and how can we really adjust these new practices um, and keep them on the long term? Because if they were effective to tackle one emergency, uh, they should be uh, um, you know, effective to, um, to just work on the various um, emergency we, we're facing outside of uh, COVID-19. Um, and Leah, do you want a final word? Uh, I know Megan already answered for your project, but perfect. Okay. So thanks everybody. Really interesting presentations. And I think it was a great Q&A. Um, so we will close this session now. And I think the next one is starting at 3 p.m. Um, and it's a session on grant making priorities and the role of foundations in, a, in enabling a more resilient grassroots sector. So you don't want to miss that one, um, but go and get a coffee or some lunch. <laughs>